My name is Nei Chu, and I'm from the marketing department from Libra, Malaysia. We are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Extending Post-Surgery Energesia with Continuous Peripheral Nerve Block. This webinar is organized in partnership with Special Interest Group in Regional Anesthesia, College of Anesthesiologists, and Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists. We have three speakers presenting today, and we will start with a five minute, um, next, next slide please, on the agenda. We will have three speakers presenting today, and we will start with a five minute uh, welcome and introduction. And this will be followed by 30 minute sharing. And today's topic would be current evidence of perioperative continuous peripheral nerve block continuous peri peripheral nerve block catheter selection and insertion technique, continuous peripheral nerve block, local anesthetic solution and infusion strategies. This will followed by a 25 minute Q&A session. Next slide, please. So some housekeeping message before we start. First, your microphone will be automatically muted throughout the session. There will be questions. Um, if there's any question, please post your question in the Q&A box anytime throughout this session. And do take note that this session will be recorded. A link and passcode will be shared at the end of the session for you to generate your e-certificate. And for Malaysian doctors, please scan the QR code with the MMA apps to claim your CPD points. This event will be translated live in Vietnamese language. If you have a laptop desktop user, please click on the interpreter icon and then select your preferred language and mute the original audio. For mobile users, please click on the more icon and select language interpretation. Then select your preferred language and mute the original audio. With that, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sharidan Mohamad Fadil, who is a consultant anesthesiologist from Branigas Medini Hospital, Malaysia. He is passion, his passion are ultrasound guided regional anesthesia and point of care ultrasound. He was the past convener for the special interest group in regional anesthesia College of Anesthesiologists and is the member of ex executive committee of the college and past president of the Society of Critical and Emergency of Sonograph. And with that, I would like to pass this session to Dr. Sharidan to take over. Dr. Sharidan. Thank you, Mechu, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you, Esclap Academy and B. Braun for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, over the past one year or so, we have, uh, the SIGRA has conducted uh, quite a few uh, regional anesthesia webinars. Um, I thought, or we thought it is timely to actually now uh, move um, a step further uh, by also talking on the continuous regional anesthesia techniques. Uh, so we have with us three uh, renowned speakers. I would like to introduce them all straight away so that there'll be minimal interruptions between the talk. Our first speaker, none other than Dr. Amiruddin Nick Mamad Kamil, uh, who is uh, a consultant and anesthesiologist in HKL, uh, the largest government tertiary hospital. He is also the lead person for the regional anesthesia program in the Ministry of Health. And he is the first uh, um, uh, European Diploma Regional Anesthesia holder. Uh, he will uh, be our first speaker. Our second speaker is uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Mohamad. Rashidan Abdul Ghani. He is working at the moment in Kulia of Medicine in International Islamic University, Malaysia. He has special interest in regional anesthesia, water treatment system, and medical ethics. He is also a postgraduate holder of diploma in regional anesthesia under the University of Montpellier. In, uh, he uh, um, passed that in 2016. Um, and our um, Final speaker, Dr. Michael Bezi Yuan, uh, is currently a consultant and a practicing 
uh, in AOC Orthopedic Specialist Center, uh, Subang Jaya, and in Asunta Hospital. He was previously working in University of Malaya Medical Center as a medical lecturer. He was the head of the regional anesthesia and acute pain service in UMMC then, and has set up the regional anesthesia services registry and training program for the hospital. So we have uh, these three heavyweights uh, of regional anesthesia in Malaysia with us today to share with us uh, the topics uh, regarding continuous peripheral nerve blocks. Without further ado, uh, since this is 10.06, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Amaruddin Nick Mohamed Kamil to deliver the talk to start the ball rolling with the current evidence for perioperative continuous PNB. All right, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, indeed, I'm uh, very excited today uh, because I was told that uh, I think close to 100,000 has registered uh, for this webinar. And not only from Malaysia, uh, there are also participants from the Asia Pacific country. And uh, I know uh, you all are busy and thank you for uh, allocating some time to join uh, us for this webinar. And I wish all of you are safe and healthy during this pandemic uh, COVID crisis. Uh, wherever you are, okay, uh, and assalamualaikum, good morning, and hello to everyone. Uh, I have nothing to declare or any uh, conflict of interest uh, uh, regarding to this webinar. And uh, the perioperative pain uh, management is the bread and butter uh, for the anesthesiologist. And uh, if a poorly managed uh, severe post-operative pain, uh, if it's, it is a poor, poorly managed, uh, it can lead to multiple complications. Uh, example, uh, persistent post-operative pain, i.e. the chronic uh, pain. So I believe uh, the mainstay of the uh, analgesia uh, for the post-op pain management is still multimodal. And I am the proponent of the peripheral nerve block and uh, I believe the per peripheral nerve block plays the uh, biggest role uh, in uh, in the, the in the multimodal technique. So uh, this paper uh, from Germany, uh, uh, this paper reports on the pain intensity on the first day of the surgery. Uh, this is about. Uh, this is from about 100 plus hospitals from Germany. And uh, they reported uh, the pain severity uh, in all major surgeries. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the, the pain scores, uh, some of it, especially the top uh, five, the obstetrics, the trauma, the abdominals uh, from general surgery, the cardiothoracic surgery, some of the patients has, uh, I would say, a severe pain despite all the multimodal uh, treatment. So, and uh, I believe uh, there are a lot of evidence uh, that peripheral nerve block uh, can, uh, I mean, can uh, give a good outcome uh, by, uh, by providing a peripheral nerve block to a patient. Example from this paper from Dr. Barrington, uh, this is a paper that reporting uh, the re inter inter International Registry of Regional Anesthesia, uh, which is the registry uh, which has a large number of uh, collection of data and part of the uh, registry, they also ask about some questions about satisfaction to the patient. Uh, I would like to highlight the questions number four. Uh, to what degree did you have pain after the operation was finished? And as you can see uh, in the graph, uh, the severe pain control uh, in that patient has received regional anesthesia it's quite minimal, probably less than 10%. And uh, they also asked the patient about the 
whether the patient is willing to repeat the block. And if you can see uh, the question number four down there, the percentage of patient that willing to repeat the block is quite high, more than 95%, despite uh, they reported a severe uh, pain uh, after the operation. Mean peripheral nerve block uh, is quite versatile, uh, if you ask me. And uh, Dr. Bancho also commented in a letter to editor uh, in relation to the, to the Dr. Barrington's paper, uh, I would like uh, to capture uh, his words. Uh, we want our patients to be as comfortable as possible. And if the option of regional anesthesia, uh, should we not promote its effectiveness and advantages over other pain control? Okay, what better reason do we need to stop adopting the merits of regional anesthesia? So, so what? What do you think uh, stopping us from doing peripheral uh, nerve block uh, uh, if we think it's a business class pain management uh, that is highlighted by the uh, Dr. Ban Chui? So in peripheral nerve block, is single shot enough? The, uh, you, we know that the duration uh, of the post-operative analgesia depends on the injected local anesthetic duration. And after uh, loading a bolus dose of uh, local anesthetic in a single shot uh, block, uh, severe post-operative pain can occur after 12 to 14 hours after a, a single shot. So this is what we call a rebound pain. And a rebound pain is characterized by a delay increase uh, in analgesic uh, consumption where patient uh, after the uh, block has uh, regressed, uh, they will have a severe pain and they will need an increased analgesic requirement. And this corresponds to the uh, resolution of the uh, local anesthetic effect. So, and this paper from Dr. Ki Jin Chin regarding managing rebound pain after regional anesthesia. And uh, this graph, the red line there, uh, if a patient does not receive any peripheral nerve block, uh, the pain score, the VAS score to start immediate after the post-op is, is very high, uh, 80. And, uh, after the uh, post-operative uh, period, it, ha it will, I mean, after the multimodal treatment, uh, it will come down probably around 50. And the blue line is where the peripheral nerve block single shot, uh, about after 12 hours post-operatively, the patient suddenly can have a severe rebound pain. And I would like to highlight uh, the uh, light blue line down there. It started very low with minimal pain postoperatively, and it continues still low uh, pain control. I mean, low pain uh, score uh, up to 48 hours. And this is what Dr. Banchoy means by business class pain management, and provide this is. Uh, given by the uh, the continuous peripheral nerve block plus multimodal analgesia. I hope now everyone convinced that the continuous peripheral nerve block is the way to go in treating severe post-operative pain. So what is a continuous peripheral nerve block? It's actually a perineural local anesthetic infusion, which involves the percutaneous insertion of a catheter adjacent to the nerve. And through this catheter, we can run, uh, infuse a local anesthetic uh, for purpose of anesthesia or analgesia. Uh, we can tailor the requirement. We can give bolus. We can uh, run the baseline infusion uh, to, to manage the uh, post-operative pain. And the catheter insertion can be guided via electrical stimulation or ultrasound 
or we can use combination of both. So uh, this is just to show that after the insertion, how we anchor the uh, peripheral, the continuous peripheral nerve uh, catheter. Uh, this is at the, at the in, uh, interscaling catheter. And this is another nicely uh, positioned uh, bilateral axis shift catheter. So, uh, in terms of uh, catheter insertion, uh, which technique uh, should we use? I mentioned about ultrasound guidance, uh, stimulating needle, and both. Uh, this paper uh, from anesthesiology uh, reported. Uh, the uh, the the they studied on the three types of insertion uh, whether ultrasound alone uh, using a stimulating needle or catheter alone and combination of both techniques and they found that ultrasound guidance alone without adding uh, either stimulating needle or needle catheter uh, is the uh, or combination is the best approach to femoral perineural uh, catheter. So, I, in my practice, um, I've never used electrical stimulation for quite some time, and I, I concur with this paper. Actually, it saves a lot of time using the ultrasound guidance alone. Uh, it's the best technique to insert the uh, the peripheral nerve catheter. And what are the approaches has been reported uh, in the literature? Uh, I'm quite surprised. Uh, some centers has inserted for the head and neck, uh, the approaches uh, mandibular, maxillary, the lesser palatine nerves and cervical plexus. Okay, I've never done that. Uh, shoulder and proximal humerus, the approaches are interscaline, cervical paravertebral, uh, the intersternal cleidomastoid, which is very rarely done, uh, supraclavicular and suprascapular. Uh, for the elbow, forearm, and hand surgery, supraclavicular, infraclavicular approaches. Uh, the thoracic paravertebral intercostal for thorax, thorax and breast surgery. The paravertebral tap block, tap approaches, QL approaches for abdominal and inguinal surgery. And the, for the approaches for the hip and thigh and leg surgery, uh, posterior lumbar plexus, uh, femoral, fascia ilaca, paracycle approaches has been reported. And for the, the others like adductor canal uh, and as well as subglutal and popliteal approaches. Uh, uh, has been reported, I mean, to tailor uh, surgery for the leg uh, and below. So, uh, how uh, do you insert the catheter? Okay, uh, whether using a short axis or long axis, as we know that we can scan uh, the nerve structures. Uh, longitudinal or short axis uh, to, the, to the nerve. And uh, this paper is actually uh, studying whether the catheter insertion uh, perpendicular to the nerve, uh, which is the short axis technique, short axis insertion of the catheter or parallel to the nerve, uh, which one is better and they found that the catheter perpendicular to the nerve techniques is better okay so uh, if you ask me uh, uh, the i i prefer uh, the short axis technique because it saves a lot of time okay and uh, as long as the tip of the catheter is placed close to the nerve it should be fine And uh, what are the in indications has been reported? Of course, uh, intraoperative anesthesia, uh, we know that, okay? 
post-operative analgesia, this is what uh, we should uh, target uh, or do for our patients to get a good pain control. Uh, the, there are also uh, requirements, I mean, requests, especially from the uh, emergency department for analgesia after tra traumatic ribs or femur fracture. Uh, and I found there's also a report how to treat abdominal wall pain during pregnancy using a continuous technique. And uh, induced sympathectomy to improve trans transplantation. There's also a request from the hand and microvascular surgeon uh, to improve the perfusion of the transplantation of the uh, limb. And uh, post adhesive capsulitis release joint surgery, which after uh, the capsulitis, uh, the adhesive uh, capsulitis release, patient can have severe pain and uh, pay, uh, the surgeon will ask for uh, immediate physiotherapy to prevent further uh, addition. So these are all indications that has been reported uh, for a continuous technique. So what are the benefits? We know that it can give a superior pain control, less reporting of severe pain during rest and movement, and they all require less opioid, okay? And if a patient receives a peripheral nerve block, uh, the first analgesia that requires, uh, if they need a, a added analgesia, uh, it's quite delayed, so it's a prolonged time to first analgesia request. They have a better satisfaction. They can sleep better at night. Uh, reduce post-operative nausea vomiting because of the less uh, opioid usage, and they have uh, they can be discharged faster. So this is the emoji uh, of the patient. Uh, let's say you insert a catheter at 10 a.m. in the morning, and it works well, and they are all happy. And this is at 10 p.m. Uh, in the evening. Why suddenly uh, they cry? So continuous technique is not without problem, okay? So uh, this is a paper from Peter Mahofer. Uh, he studied uh, on a 20 volunteers where he inserted uh, catheters uh, at the interscalene and femoral. And after that, uh, he subjected the volunteers to regular exercise. And later, uh, he will scan uh, the catheters and look for the uh, LA spread uh, around the nerve. And they he found that overall, overall catheter dislocation rate is about 15%, okay? And this is quite significant uh, correlation between time and uh, rate of dislocation. And the other complications reported uh, infection, okay? Abscess at the uh, psoas muscle and the thigh muscle. And uh, paper from Cat de Villa, uh, looking at the rate of infection, uh, the overall uh, is just colonization is about 20% to 57%, but formation of abscesses at the catheter site is quite low. It's about 0.1 to 0.9%. And if what happens if you keep the catheter for longer period? Uh, so if at 24 hours, the, the that's not, the the incidence of uh, inflammation is not significant compared to a uh, single shot, but if the longer you keep uh, the catheter, uh, the 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 rate of uh, the incidence of local inflammation can be as high as eleven percent. And the other papers that review uh, about continuous catheter technique is the worry about local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And 
uh, I I think this, although it's quite rare uh, nowadays to have a laugh, okay, but uh, you have to be careful, especially uh, the interfacial plane block uh, where we injected a high volume of local anesthetic and if we continue with a high rate of infusion, uh, you have to be careful, be careful uh, of LAS. Uh, but it's quoted here, uh, one study of bilateral tap block catheters found uh, that a 10 mil per hour infusion of 0.2% ropivacaine uh, initiated 30 minutes after a loading dose of 100 mg ropivacaine per site resulted in a continuing rise in plasma concentration up to 48 hours. And this is, of course, they are inter individual variability, uh, and they also mention, uh, although the plasma ropivacaine concentration is uh, at the toxic level, but the unbound uh, unbound level is still very low. So probably uh, that's the reason uh, why it's quite safe to run a a uh, high uh, infusion rate in interfacial plane block. So uh, in summary, the cons, the cons for using peripheral technique is actually, uh, peripheral technique is quite technically demanding. You can have a secondary block failure uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, you can have a risk of infection. You can have risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity and a real risk of fall in a lower limb uh, continuous peripheral nerve block technique. So I just want to highlight a bit uh, uh, usage of uh, continuous technique in some surgery. I quote the prospect, uh, which is the procedure specific uh, post-op pain management. Okay, They are actually a group of people, I mean, anesthetists and surgeon and uh, they they have their own methodology uh, to come up with the guidelines, okay? And this is quite recent, although they have not uh, published the papers on this. This is from the prospect session on knee surgery, uh, which can I mean can be accessed uh, by the extra members uh, in the extra academy section. Uh, the pre-op and intra-op recommendations uh, oral and or IV paracetamol, uh, oral or IV NC, uh, they recommended IV DEXA 10 milligram. They recommended intra-op high volume uh, local inf infiltration but performed by surgeon. And uh, the role of adductor canal block is still questionable. Post-operatively, uh, con to continue with paracetamol and NC, and I'm quite surprised the the down the non-recommended techniques are epidural, intratical morphine, uh, femoral nerve block, cytic nerve block, uh, gabapentinoid, continuous infusion peripheral nerve blocks, or continuous LIA are all not recommended. So uh, this is another paper just to highlight uh, if you use a continuous uh, technique in adductor canal, which is supposed to be a motor sparing technique. Uh, the, the graph there, uh, this is looking at the, uh, the discharge readiness after the arthroplasty. Uh, the winner is the adductor canal, canal uh, catheter technique, which they can be discharged earlier at uh, post-op day two. So probably in future prospect will take this in, into consideration. So uh, let's move on to the total hip arthroplasty, the recommendation from the prospect. And uh, the pre-op and intra-op recommendation, as you can see, uh, they also recommended dexamethasone 10 milligram IV, single shot fascia iliaca block uh, is also recommended, which is grade D, and post-operatively, uh, there's no continuous technique uh, recommendation from the prospect group. So uh, the 
uh, the hip and knee surgery, um, uh, the, can, the continuous technique for hip and knee surgery are not recommended uh, by the prospecting. But I would like to highlight this uh, pericapsular nerve, uh, nerve block, which is uh, the new kids on the block. Okay. And uh, this paper reported they use a continuous catheter in pain block for a, a hip arthroplasty and the 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 the, the, uh, the what it says there uh, they get a good effective post operative pain management with, without the motor blockade so uh, the best part for uh, continuous technique is for rotator cuff surgery where they recommended a continuous interscaline breaker plexus block over a single shot interscaline breaker plexus block. So uh, there's a role of continuous technique uh, in a rotator cuff surgery. And just to highlight some uh, recent news about uh, liposomal bupivacaine. Liposomal bupivacaine uh, has been quoted, I mean, to replace a catheter technique because uh, it is supposed to uh, provide a prolonged analgesia uh, because of the design of the uh, bupivacaine in the liposome. But this paper somehow, uh, which look into the analgesic efficacy, which is the systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, this is the... Uh, MEQ ratio, the morphine equivalent ratio at 24 hours, in which uh, the morphine requirement just favors towards lipobupivacaine very minimal. And again, a minimal effect in the lipobupivacaine uh, usage. Okay? And pain scores at 24 hours, favors slightly towards the lipobupivacaine and pain scores at 72 hours slightly just to lipobupivacaine. And there's not much difference in pain scores in uh, this lipobupivacaine uh, formulation. So in conclusion, the meta-analysis shows no clinical analgesic benefit of lipobupivacaine usage. So I think at the moment, uh, the, the continuous technique uh, is still the winner where I think uh, taking into consideration uh, the cost of lipobupivacaine, uh, I would say uh, the continuous uh, peripheral nerve block is still the way to go. So uh, before I end my presentation, I would like to highlight uh, the trends in uh, continuous technique. Uh, this is a report, a short report from the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System, where they compare a continuous technique uh, in uh, TKR, uh, comparing veterans hospital and without non-veterans hospital. And uh, there are increase of, uh, in the percentage of patients using a continuous technique in veterans hospital uh, but there's a slightly decrease in the non-veterans the non uh, affairs uh, hospital. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, it's good that the, the take-up rate is, has increased in the veterans uh, affairs hospital, but it's just about 15, 20%. So actually, uh, people are not embracing uh, the continuous technique uh, very much. And uh, this table is still, uh, I mean, has shown that the usage of uh, the non-systemic, non-opioid uh, analgesia uh, is still uh, dominant. So has continuous technique become less popular? Is it because we are trending towards minimally invasive surgery? Is it because it's time consuming and it's technically challenged? And is it because uh, it will cost 
the, the it's not cost effective? Uh, do we have a better adjuvant? And it's, is it because we have a better uh, oral analgesic post-operatively? So in conclusion, I would like to highlight that actually working uh, con uh, continuous technique leads to high patient satisfaction, minimal side effects, and this can hasten rehabilitation process. But you have to remember this is actually technically demanding. Uh, you have to spend uh, extra time, resources to make it work. Uh, continuous technique is not a one size fits all technique. And my advice is to tailor the continuous technique to the surgery and indication at your own uh, institutional practice. Thank you.